Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I want to talk a little bit about the survival of the fittest and how I decide what in my collection stays and goes. And the thing that prompted this is, well, yesterday on the channel, I released a video review of the Benchmade Anthem. Benchmade Anthem was an incredible knife, and at the end of the review I said something along the lines of it's a gem, and this is something that I'm going to be sending off for anodization and uh, that it's going to stick around in my permanent collection. The thing is, though, um, that knife has now been sold. It stuck around for a solid four months, but it is now gone. But every time I do this, every time I recommend something and then later on end up selling it, people get, you know, confused, scared, uh, afraid, whatever. And they'll say things like, well, Nick, why are you selling gear that you say that you love? If you recommend it, why aren't you keeping it? What's wrong with it? What aren't you telling us? Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. They, they're freaking out. Um, but the thing is, that's a perfectly valid question. Uh, but that's what I want to address here today. So um, in, the, uh, the, in the gear world, there is the term safe queen, which is a piece of gear that you just keep at home. You keep in the safe, so to speak. You never use it. You never carry it. You never you just you, you have it around the fondle. The thing is, for a lot of people, that makes sense, particularly if they're coming at this from like an investment perspective. If you're buying Patek Philippe's, you know, for future investment, then it kind of almost makes sense if you can afford to keep that money, you know, tied up in a, in a completely un, uh, completely factory sealed package, then okay, sure, whatever. Um, that, that, I guess, makes sense. But the thing is, I don't want to go there. I don't want to have safe queens, whether it's a watch or a knife or otherwise. Every piece of gear that I, I own, I want to be something that I use on a regular basis and that I enjoy on a regular basis. And that's because every piece of gear I have has an ongoing cost to me. The biggest of these costs is financial. Um, and, you know, it's it's a real deal. I do okay, but the thing is, I'm just not in a position where I can forget about hundreds of bucks in the back of a drawer. You know, this knife right here, the Grimsmo Rask, I like this knife a lot. But if I were to sell it, I could make, you know, six or seven hundred bucks. Well, okay, I'm sorry, hype. I could make, you know, a grand off of this right now because the world is completely insane. But anyways, um, you know, there is a financial cost of having this money tied up in this knife rather than in my bank account. And it makes it a lot easier, particularly if you're willing to sell things on a regular basis, to uh, to do collecting. If I keep my collection small and fluid as I do, you know, try and limit it to maybe 10 or 12 knives that are just for me, that are part of my permanent collection, then I can afford to try new things. And I can have a collection that's not huge, but that is pretty optimized for the price that, uh, you know, a lot of people, well... You know, as weird as it sounds, my knife collection is actually relatively small compared to a lot of folks. So there is a financial cost, and that is a real deal. For me, there's the opportunity cost. I could have 600 bucks or whatever uh, tied up in this knife, or I could have it elsewhere. And so that's that's one issue. Another issue with the less concrete costs, things like storage space. Um, you know, every knife, you know, comes with boxes, papers, materials, and just a place to physically keep the knife. And I don't want to do the hoarder thing. I don't want to have boxes upon boxes and upon boxes for stuff that I own. Um, there's also decision fatigue. If I have a huge knife collection every morning, trying to figure out the best choice of knife or the huge watch collection, figuring out the best watch, although it can be pleasurable, there's also an element of like, oh God, I have too many options. Here. Um, there's also a slight personal moral stress, if you will, because I feel some weird obligation to my gear in order to carry it and give it the life it deserves. If a piece of gear that I own is just going to basically rust in a drawer, that's a terrible thing for a functional tool to have happen. Um, this is very weird, perhaps. Well, not perhaps, it's just very weird, but it is a thing for me. And all of those little concrete costs, or a little less concrete costs, add up with the financial cost and mean that if a piece of gear isn't getting carried and used regularly after weeks and months, um, no matter how much I love it and how matter much, you know, it just it doesn't end up sticking around. And alas, nothing really is sacred. Because, you know, people say, well, but Nick, it was a gem. Well, yeah, sure, but that's that's not enough. It needs to be a gem that I'm using on a regular basis. And heck, even gear that I love has been sold. Um, you know, the Shiro Neon, for instance. It's not enough. At the end of the day, it is kind of survival of the fittest. I have sold and, frankly, will continue to sell some pieces that I never thought would leave the collection. It is fluid and, you know, I, I try not to have too much crazy attachment to this will be around forever and ever. Because, let's face it, I'm 
not going to be around forever and ever. That's a little optimistic. Um, but the thing is, uh, there, there have been many examples of this. Knives that are, and other gear that I've thought, you know, oh, this is being around forever, but then wound up not sticking around. The Anthem, uh, the Shirogorov Neon, and the Hati. The Hati, particularly, oh, man, if I could keep safe, Queens, that was a great knife, too. The Casio Oceanus watch was an incredible watch, but when I have other ones that I wear more, just didn't make sense to keep it. Citizen Perpetual Diver, the Alamic Wayfarer Custom, the most beautiful knife I've owned, uh, but also a lot of money and one's up that I was carrying, Lodge Sebenza 21 in Singo. I feel the, uh, the, the I missed that one more as a reviewer than anything, because it's a great point of comparison to pull into things. Um, the titanium version of this pen, I, I like that a lot, but ultimately didn't get carried. Uh, let's see here. All of those guys, though, sorry, I'm a little less organized, I'm just kind of more extemporaneous. Um, each of these things was great, and it was something that I really liked and loved, and something that I would recommend to you in a heartbeat, but all of them have now gone by the wayside, um, just because of that competition, and there were a few things that kind of need to happen for gear to stick around. In order for it to stick around, it needs to be, or at least it's helpful if it is the very best at something. You know, for me at least, this is the very best everyday watch I have found, for a bunch of reasons. I mean, it's plenty accurate. Uh, it, it has this incredible uh, adjustable bracelet, which is just makes it better than any other watch I've tried. It's very legible. It's got great loom. Um, it's got the... I, I like this very much, and for me at least, it is a great choice of everyday watch. Or this guy over here is a great dress watch. Even if it's not as good of a watch as this guy, I think... Although it's, it's got a lot going for it. Um, this sticks around because it's the best dress watch I've yet found, at least, you know, for this kind of price point. Um, at least for me in my life. Uh, similarly, other things stick around because they're very good slices. For instance, in the knife world, there were a couple of, like, the Kershaw Dividend sticks around because it's just so damn slicey. Um, the, the action on it, uh, you know, the, the, the Rask or the Norsemen are incredible action showpieces. Um, and so that's one reason that they stick around. I The Razel is a great hard use piece, and it is the best knife I have if I want to be beaten on things. And then, of course, you know, uh, portability and whatnot. Um, you know, a, a very, very small knife like the Rhodey may stick around just because it's got that niche and it covers it well. One other thing is that inexpensive items tend to stick around more readily because there is a much greater incentive to free up, you know, 400 bucks for a Benchmade Anthem than there would be to sell off, you know, 60 bucks in a Spider to go roadie. The opportunity cost is much higher there. Another thing that kind of needs to happen is that whatever I've got needs to fit perfectly. There can't be gripes, really, or there can't be too many of them. Can't be little points of friction. So like, for instance, um, the Hati was just a little bit too big for me, the Shirogorov Hati. Um, and the Neon had just a bad clip. Um, and so every time I carried that, the clip made me sad. And so eventually that sadness added up and it Kicked it out of the, the island there. Basically, to stick around in the permanent collection, you really, really have to... You can't have much in the way of questionable issues, much in the way of problems, or you have to be exceptional enough otherwise to get past it. And, uh, you know, it even has to fit my changing whims and my desires and things like that, um, because things change. My tastes change. You know, what once would have impressed me in terms of action no longer necessarily does, uh, or, or vice versa. And, you know, oh, I'm getting, you know, honestly, I'm getting a little bit tired of frame lock flippers. And so I bet the bar right now is a little bit higher for a brand new frame lock flipper than it might have been for something that is brand new and doing something different. I guess it's still a flipper, but it's a front flipper. There's booze blades uh, smoke. But anyways, I mean, so something like this might stick around more readily than a brand new knife that's very much similar to everything else. The whims and the desires are very real and they're very personal, and it has nothing to do with the item and more to do with the jackass back here. And then finally, it kind of needs to fit in well, um, because I can't afford to have too many pieces in any one niche. I mean, the Razel has gotten rid of so many high-end pieces. The CTO 562 CF. I could have kept that and been very happy with that as a hard-use beater forever, but I have the Razel, so it doesn't matter. And I think the same thing is going to happen to this little guy, the TAD Dauntless here. This would be another good hard use beatery knife, uh, except that, well, I've got that. And so, you know, two of them are in competition, and I think this guy's going to win, ultimately. And so that niche needs to be there. It needs to fit into something, and it needs to excel in that category beyond all else. But the thing I really want to get across most strongly is the fact that I've sold something doesn't actually change my recommendation, or at least it sure shouldn't, in any meaningful way.
If I call something a gem, if I say something is incredible, that's something that I'm saying about the piece of gear. If I keep it around in my collection, that's something I'm saying about me in many ways. That's something I'm saying about it integrating with the sum of the rest of the parts here. And so there are many, many very good pieces which just don't fit in that well for me. For instance, you know, this guy, the Koenig Arius. Um, I know for a fact that this is not going to stick around in my collection. It is an absolutely incredible knife. I, I, there is so much to love here. And it is wonderful, 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 but it's big and it's not going to fill a niche that something else won't. And so it won't stick around, but that doesn't mean it's any less excellent. And so I really, I, I'm always a little bit frustrated when people say, well, you sold it, so it couldn't have been that good. No, I, the, the fact that I ever decided I might keep it means it's top of the freaking rock. And so I, I really do want people to keep that in mind. This is a deeply personal choice, and it is a deeply personal factor. And although, you know, I, I can't ever claim to be objective as a reviewer, I always have my own thoughts, my own opinions and feelings on matters. Um, past the point, this is really, really personal. Um, and it's not really something that I think generalizes well to everybody else's feelings, thoughts, and opinions. If I'm making the recommendation, I'm making the recommendation. If I sell it later on, it's on me, not it. So anyways, um, I, I hope this has been at least slightly illuminating for you. And I, I've addressed these issues a little bit before, but um, I'm curious. I mean, is anybody else thinking about their collection in this same way of, you know, survival of the fittest? And if so, what is the thing that you thought would never leave but ended up leaving? Let me know down in the comments there. But anyways, I hope this has been interesting to you, um, that you found this remotely interesting, and that you mostly have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of the day, and that because you are plenty fit, for your tasks, you are able to survive. Huh? Uh, actually got grim pretty quickly. All right, have a good one. Bye now.